welcome once again to this India Today special, Royal Stag Barrel Select Perfect Strokes, where we are bringing together some of the iconic sports persons of our times to discuss what makes the perfect sports person. With me, A.B. De Villiers, the champion South African batsman, Gary Kasparov, the world's greatest chess player, Mo Farah, the long distance champion to beat all champions, and Rick Charlesworth, World Cup winner in hockey with Australia, both as player and then, of course, an Olympic winner as coach as well. Great to have all four of you on the show once again. Let me now ask you your perfect sports person. If you had to choose one person, and we'll start with you, Gary, since you have, I'm sure, someone whom you've looked up to and said, this is my perfect sports person from whom I could learn. I have to look at the history of chess because obviously when I was a kid, so I looked for some great stars of the past and I, I wanted just to learn from them. So my chess-wise, so my, uh, my idol was a uh, uh, big champion of the past, Alexander Lukin. I loved his games. I could feel um, uh, similarities in our, in, in, in our chess style. Um, and then later I recognized that, you know, in order just to be uh, the best, you have to learn from all of them. So it's not about having a similar style, but it's just picking from, from each great player, so a piece that could, could, could benefit, benefit you. And of course, I have to say that at the time when I, I learned how to play chess and I, I made my first steps in climbing to the top, so that was Bobby Fischer's time. So, and Fischer's determination, passion, and uh, a total devotion of the game, of course, had a tremendous impact on my chess maturity. Okay, you don't have to choose someone necessarily from your own sport. No, but let's it's, it's, get it. It's, it's, that's that's I, have I to can, start with chess. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I can see yeah. the links. A.B. De Villiers, your, your role model for a perfect sports person. Yeah, it's so many, so many, too many to mention because I grew up in a sports crazy family and there were thousands of people that I, that I admired growing up. One that stands out now, and for some reason I heard his name earlier, Boris Becker, um, won Wimbledon at the age of 17, I think. And I remember watching that game live and emulating his service style later on in that day when I went to play with my mom. So I, th I think he was pretty close to that. The way he played once again, that he mentioned now, I could relate to his style of play, that, um, that instinct to, to take the game away from his opponent. It was just amazing to watch him play when I was younger. Surely not the jumps, uh, you know, Absolutely. He, he's jumping around on a court, falling down, getting up again. You like the intensity. I love that. And just when he was finished, then in 1992, John T. Rhodes did that run out. And then I started diving at school. So I was on the, on the floor more often than not. Rick Charlesworth? I think in basketball, Jordan was exceptional. And uh, in, in cricket, I, uh, from an early age... Um, Perhaps in bowling, Dennis Lilly, I, I played against him in the nets. He was my roommate on tour, but he was an exceptional competitor for Australia. And Vivian Richards uh, in, in batting, in, in, in the era that I watched, he was uh, also exceptional. He, this is a guy who took the game away from the other team in a way in which this guy does. Mo Farah? Oh, it's, it's a hard one. <laughs> um, even though I'm a football fan, um, I think it have to be Muhammad Ali. Just what he did for generally sport and growing up for me was just, you know, watching him, it was just incredible. That's interesting you're using Ali. Is that, does that mean that f to be a role model or a perfect sports person, it's not just what you do on the field, but what you do off it? Is that as important? Because Ali became this iconic sports person because of what he represented in the age in which he lived, through the Olympic mm -hmm. gold into the river, and then sort of spoke out for, yeah. for, for equality, racial equality. Do you believe that makes the difference? I, I think so, 100%. I, I'm a big believer that that is what, what was right. And at the same time, for me, I've got four kids. And um, what I see them, and if people look up to me, like I remember supporting Arsenal, the, the, seeing some of the players, it's being able to encourage other athletes, other youngsters, and change generation, giving back. The sports has helped us. Because if it wasn't for me at school and my teachers and the people, I would never get to a position where I am. So it's all important that we recognize and do charity work and, and give back. I think it's always the key. Is that important? Because, you know, you, you've taken strong political positions. You've taken on Putin and the rest in, in, in Russia. Is that important for a sports person, in a sense, to, to reach that? If he reaches an iconic level on the field, then to also have a voice of it, like Ali had, like you have. 
Yes, I, I think it's absolutely crucial because uh, uh, it's your notoriety, your fame is like a capital. You can invest it. You can invest it in advertising so and make money, but you can also uh, invest it in, in, in some political uh, adventure, in some political uh, um, case. You can back it. And um, uh, people respect you for that, and a lot of people can make choices, right choices, because you did it. I mean, no doubt, it, the, 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 uh, uh, the stand Ali took in, in late 60s, which, by the way, brought him to jail, you know, speaking against the war sure. in Vietnam. So, and then come back. I mean, they had a phenomenal effect. I mean, there were many great champions. I mean, for instance, the foreman who he beat in this, his, his famous Rumble in the Jungle. Yes. So just don't forget, it's just many years later, he came back. And at the, in, in his late 40s, he won the title. So just, it tells you how great was an athlete that Ali, Ali managed to beat. But it's not just, you know, Ali's victory and, uh, or his great matches with Fraser, for instance. But it's just it, the fact that, you know, it's, it, it, was, it was a combination. So you can look at the history and, I mean, there are many, you know, great uh, 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 track racers. But, I mean, what Jesse Owens did in 1936, you know, just winning four gold medals in front of Führer in <laughs> Berlin. German, so yeah. this, exactly, yeah, this is, it's sometimes your victories and your, uh, and the stand you take, they have much bigger impact than simply winning, winning gold medals uh, or, or, or breaking world records. Because people remember it not only for your result, but for also political implications. And that's that stand with us for for decades, if not for longer. And same as you said, for humanity and what you believe. You know, I, I, I'm just wondering, is that putting too much pressure on a sports person? You know, we, uh, uh, the film Invictus was made on the remarkable victory of the South African rugby team in the mid-90s in the World Cup, and they became heroes overnight. Is it fair to ask a sports person, just don't show me perfection on the field, but you've got to become a role model of it, you've got to stand for something of it. Is that, is that asking too much? of a sports person? It's a huge privilege, and um, with that comes responsibility, obviously. Um, I, I don't know if I'm the political kind of guy, but, <laughs> but maybe, who knows, maybe in 10 years' time we, I can run some, some party back home, we'll see. We definitely need it in South Africa at the moment, there's a bit of a divide going on there, but um, we've had our struggles for, for many years. Um, we know the story of Nelson Mandela, um, how he's battled through everything, and how he's changed our country, and, and sport is a great vehicle to, to communicate to to um, two people around the world. But so that, that's that's famous rugby match in 1994. Mm -hmm. I mean, played a, played a crucial role, the beating New Zealand Absolutely. in the final. So that's that's united. That's helped to unite the country. So that's 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 why we, we can remember that sport can actually play a phenomenal role in bringing people together and helping to to close the divide. Because more you you know you become a role model for the African community now living in in, in England to to believe that they can achieve what Mo Farah did. Yeah, and I said that, that sports is, we have a chance in life in sports to be able to meet another athlete. And it all brings them together, no matter where you're from. You put that to the side, religion, where were you put it doesn't matter. It's about sports, being able to put them together and, and as a fellow other, meet other athletes and look at the Olympics, the legacy of the Olympics. You know, why was the Olympics brought together five continents? It's be able to get the best out of, you know, humanity and, and pe bring people together. But, you know, sportsmen ultimately reflect the society around them. So I'm just wondering whether money, for example, has changed the rules of the game. The commercialization of the sport makes the sports person, in a sense, at times into a commercial product. Does that reduce, in a sense, this whole quest for perfection on the sporting field? Because there are all the agents and the celebrity status that comes into the sport now, Gary Kasparov. Look, if you have more money in the game, so there will be more competitors, so the game is more popular, so that's why the value of, of, of the leading star is, is growing, so, which means you, you have to be more creative, you have to be tougher, because the competition is growing stiffer. So it's, it's, I think it's just it's a chicken and egg. So mm -hmm. yes, you, know, you could have spoiled stars. But, you know, in order to get to the status, I mean, you have to be phenomenally creative. So, again, you can look at Maradona. So, probably, you know, it's just, it's just in, in my books, probably the, the greatest soccer player because he brought a very mediocre team to the title. <laughs> so, while Pelé played in a team that could have won without him. But then look what's happened with him. But still, you know, it just, I personally, I don't care what's happened with Maradona after, you know, he left football. I still remember 1986 uh, uh, World Cup and, and what he did there. You're saying Maradona greater than Pele, which means you can't go to Brazil. 
You can travel across the world. <laughs> no, One country that might not have a give you a visa now is is Brazil. Yeah, I don't need a visa to Brazil, so that's okay. For me. <laughs> so, <laughs> but 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 you know the, the the money issue comes in cricket in the context of the growing T20 cricket leagues, young people coming into the sport. Their idea of perfection now is perhaps determined by T20, not by Test cricket. The rules change, the game changes with money coming in. Is that a fair way of looking at the sport from the outside? That T20 cricket in particular has changed the rules of the game as to what constitutes perfection, for example, on a cricket field? I'm not worried at all um, with where the game goes and the evolution of sport. It's, it's beautiful where certain sports have, have grown to, you know. Um, so that's not definitely not the issue. But individually, you've got to ask yourself, am I here to be the greatest, greatest cricketer ever to play the game or am I here to make money? Um, to me, I've never played for a cent. I've, I've always enjoyed the game. I've always wanted to be the best, and the rest happens. Um, so if you have that in place, um, I don't mind where the game goes. More money in the game is good for the game. It grows the game, bigger audience. Um, that's what we want. We want big crowds. I'm going to play in front of, of 100,000 people and score the winning runs. If there's not enough money in the game, I won't have that. So as long as your eyes are fixed on being the best there is and winning the game for your team, the money will follow and you can provide for your family. It shouldn't be the other way around. I'm hearing the view that money makes the sport actually more competitive. Does it therefore make today's contemporary sports persons better or more perfect than the sports persons of a previous era? Dr. Rick Charles, would you say that the hockey players of this generation, in a sense, are better equipped because it's a more competitive sport because of the more money that's coming in? Well, I, I think money has its problems, let me say, and the corporatization of sport has led to all sorts of difficulties. There's match, max pitching, um, um, we have uh, gambling, all of those issues. But if you talk about the quality of the athletes, then they're getting better all the time. And the athletes of today are better than they were 20 years ago, and I think they're going to be uh, much, much better than the ones from 40 years ago. I don't have any doubt about that. Uh, I think the quality of uh, the training, the time they have for the sport uh, and, and the, the science that's in sport now allows them to prepare and be much better than they, they previously were. So should, we, should I be comparing, when I look for perfection, sports persons effectively from the same era? Is it fair for me to, for example, compare what would happen if Gary Kasparov played Bobby Fischer? Who would win? No, it's, it, it, there's, there's one, you know, one uh, big flaw in this question. Because I was talking about Bobby Fischer in 1972, his pick, and Gary Kasparov, let's say, 1989 or just, you know, 1995, one of my picks. Yes. It is this, then there's, there's no fight because I was better equipped. So this is, you can talk about Fischer's talent, you know, adjusted to the extra knowledge that I learned also from Fisher's games. Or you can ask Gary Kasparov, 89 versus Magnus Carlsen, 2018. I stand no chance because he learned from me, from Fisher and others. It's about the talent, sheer talent. And of course, you know, Jesse always probably was one of the greatest talent, but look at the conditions, how he had to run, his shoes, you know, the, the, the track. So, but, but, you know, you can make an adjustment of the talent to the special conditions. That's why having more money, more visibility, makes, you know, uh, makes athletes greater because they have, you know, extra opportunities to, to, to train, so to get special equipment. So we have now computers in chess. So every generation is getting better, but it doesn't mean that the talent uh, of the great, great athletes of the past should be diminished. You know, because I'm just wondering that, you know, uh, there's this great fascination to compare athletes over generations, or even cricketers. Is De Villiers a greater player than Viv Richards or Barry Richards? When you're asked that question, what's your first reaction? No. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to answer. I, mean, I think you answered it really, really well. Uh, things, have, things change all the time. Um, but that, that sheer talent um, is, is what it's all about. And you can, you can compare that, the ability to, to win a game for your team out of nowhere. Um, and that's, that's something that I'm proud of. I've, for what I've achieved at times, to be able to turn the game around. Where the chips are down, can you turn it around for the team? <clears throat> and I think the, the, the names you mentioned all had that ability. The Barry Richards, the Graham Pollocks, Viv Richards. They had the ability to come in, the chips are down, the team's four wickets down, and they just turn the game around like that.
So, so therefore, I think we are all, all in agreement that you look at a perfect sports person or a great iconic sports person in the age in which he lived. You know, a, a Donald Bradman, 99.94 average. No one's going to match that today. Unquestionably, the best average ever. But what were they doing? He only ever played in Australia and England. He didn't play in lots of other venues. And uh, the spinners bowled most of the time. Fielding occurred with the feet. They didn't even bend over. You, do you understand what I'm saying? Com yeah. Totally different area. And, and, I, and I, I can't believe that Donald Bradman was uh, twice as good as the best batsman today. I don't believe that. You know, look at what you're doing, Mo Farah. You know, you're reinventing your sport. Here is someone, you won 5,000, 10,000 in two consecutive Olympics. What do you do next? You're running the marathon. You've just won a Chicago marathon. I mean, it almost seems that you're, you've decided to reinvent yourself and take yourself to the next level. Is that something that's come consciously? What's driven this? What is it? Is it to prove that I can do the marathon as well? No, it's, it's about me. Uh, it's something I wanted. And as an athlete, you have to be honest with yourself, as Gary said. The quicker you're honest with yourself, and as AB said, uh, the better you can do something about it. And for me, I've had an amazing career on the track. And I, 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 I dream of becoming Olympic champion once. And you do it four times, do the world champs, Europeans, European records. You know, after a while, I didn't have that drive. Is, is this never-ending quest that is being spoken about a bit of ego? You know, I've got to constantly be able to prove myself. It also makes some people perhaps play the sport even long after they've passed their best. Is, there, is that the concern that you would have as, as a coach, for example, a player has peaked and yet wants to continue to play? Yeah, always the most difficult decision. I mean, uh, I played uh, five Olympic <laughs> Games. If I'd been the coach, I wouldn't have selected me for the last one. Uh, and and uh, that's a, a decision that you're always having to make. And, uh, and I think that... But I, I, I love to play, and playing is, uh, it, it is uh, egocentric. Um, we, we love the contest, we want to do it. One of the things that I loved was training, though, and sometimes at training, you actually reached more than in the, in the match, you, you did things that you didn't think were possible. That, there was, a, there was a, a, a fantastic feeling that went with that, that uh, you, e even at training, you could, you could do something special. So when does a great then say enough is enough? That I've had my, this quest for perfection is over, I'm moving on. You've done that after having a remarkable series against the Australians. You had every reason to continue till the World Cup of 2019 and yet you said, time's up. How do you decide that time's up? Is, there, is that something that comes from within which says, I don't want to do this anymore? I can, I can give you a half an hour answer or I can <laughs> just give you a 10 second answer. <laughs> I just knew, um, I was, and I, I, I said that earlier to Rick, I, I, just, I was true to myself and, and I'm proud of that. Uh, I, I could have ended it earlier after the 2015 World Cup, I decided to keep going because I was already feeling it then. Um, and I played for another three years and I finished where I felt, um, the way I saw it, the story I had in mind played right out in front of me and I knew it was time to move on. Okay, I'm going to ask all of you in conclusion, your perfect moment that you've experienced as a sports person, maybe your own or you've seen it in someone else, which has made you say, wow, I've done something or I've achieved something. Do you have a perfect moment in your career, Dr. Charlesworth, which, which sort of stands out for you? World Cup uh, 1986, um, and uh, yeah, we, we, we broke through, if you like. We twice won the bronze medal, and, and uh, in that tournament, our team, we scored 31 goals and had six against, and we dominated the tournament and, and uh, ended up winning. That was a special, special time. Mo Farah, is there a special moment in all those four Olympic goals which says, this was the perfect race that I ran? Have to be, have to be real, because um, the reason why is I promised my oldest daughter I would get a gold medal, and I remember falling down and getting back up. Was that's what kept me going, and I think it had to be a real ten thousand meters. That moment when you fell down, did you yeah. feel it's gone? I felt for a minute it was gone, but I start to not. In my mind, I was like, oh no, race is gone. I fell over, and you start to think. But I had enough time to put that behind me and think, look. I didn't work for nothing. I have to, I promise my daughter. And I just kept going and remember going, take a deep breath, stay calm, stay calm, stay calm. And as we got into the sh less laps, laps up, more I felt myself and more I felt comfortable. 
your daughter, your promise to your daughter was, was what did it. Gary Kasparov. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say in my first match with Anatoly Karpo when I was trailing five to nothing and survived. This is the match that defined my character. But, uh, but listening to what Mo said about his daughter, so I want just to bring another moment. Because in 1997, I was already number one for 12 years. And after one of the tournaments, general journalists asked me, so what would be your get dream? So what else you want to achieve in, in, in the game of chess? I just had a newly born son, and I said, I would like my son to see his father at stage winning. So and in 2004, uh, I won the Russian National Championship in December. He was eight. Uh, um, and uh, uh, he was there, you know, and I just took my gold medal, put it around his neck, and I knew that's the end. So that's the end of my career. That's the, that's, that's the final, final goal, so the final dream. And then my next tournament in February 2005 was the, my last in, in chess career. That's a nice personal emotional moment. A.B. de Villiers, you've had a lot of time to think. No. So is, is there a perfect moment that you've had? You've got the fastest, what, 50, 100, 150 ODIs. Is there a special moment that stands out where you thought, this is the closest I've come to batting perfection? <laughs> I can mention all the records and, and touch on those, and they're all very special. But um, I, I think the moments that stand out to me are the moments where it's, it's game over, the crowd starts going home, but I still believe in my heart. I'm out there, and I know I can, t I can turn it around, and then I manage to turn it around. And that, that happened a, a few times in my career where it's, it's literally, the bookie says, okay, it's, it's done and dusted. And then I managed to find a way and to turn it around. Um, so, yes, the, the fastest 100 at the Wanderers and my World Cup 100 in Sydney and a few incredible test matches will, will definitely be in my mind forever, for the rest of my life. But those moments where I managed to turn it around for the team and to see the joy in my teammates' faces when I walk off, like, how did you manage to pull it out of that? Um, that those were the moments uh, that, I'll, that I'll always remember. A.B. de Villiers, Gary Kasparov, Mo Farah, Dr. Rick Charlesworth, it's been a pleasure and honor talking to you. Thank you very Thank much. You. You. That's it on this very special Royal Stag Battle Select Perfect Strokes on India Today. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.